Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, an update on breast pathology. I am Dr. Barbara Malkus, president of the board of directors for the Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition is dedicated to preventing environmental causes of breast cancer through community education, research advocacy, and changes to public policy. I am pleased to welcome today's presenter, Dr. Michael Misalek. Dr. Michael Misalek currently serves as Associate Chair of Pathology at Newton Wellesley Hospital in Newton, Mass. He is the Medical Director of the Vernon Cancer Center, Chemistry Laboratory, and Point of Care Testing. He practices in all areas of pathology in a busy community hospital. Holding an academic appointment at Tufts University School of Medicine, he regularly instructs medical students and pathology residents. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Misalek. Thank you for the kind introduction, Dr. Malkus. It's a pleasure to be here, and I hope over the next hour to be able to uh, highlight some of what I do as a pathologist in the care of patients with breast cancer. If you've tuned in to prior presentations that we've done, uh, last year and the year before, I talked about some basic pathology of breast cancer, what is it, the different types, and how we uh, diagnose those and sort of trace the tissue from the operating room through the lab to, to my microscope here. Uh, what I'd like to do now is kind of the next step in that process is what do we do with all that information? Uh, and most specifically is the concept of the tumor board. Uh, you may yourself or have family members who've had breast cancer and they've talked about their case being presented at, at tumor board, at breast conference, and uh, waiting for some information to come back, recommendations. What I'm going to shed some light on for you is exactly what is that tumor board? What, what is that conference? Who's there? How does it work? What kind of decisions are made? Uh, the, the different people present and how your case is, is really discussed on a personal level and personalized recommendations are made specifically for your condition, your cancer. No two cancers are alike and um, even if they look alike under the microscope, they often can behave differently. So uh, everybody's care is individualized and, and tailored. So uh, the overview here, so I'll go through the tumor board and in so doing, we'll highlight just a couple of uh, typical patients that we might discuss different types of breast cancers and end up uh, discussing some special circumstances in, in cases, uh, the concept of neoadjuvant therapy, which means some patients don't go straight to surgery. They may get uh, chemotherapy and or radiation before surgery. We'll talk about uh, how the pathologist helps in that decision and what we look for under the microscope, and also in the unfortunate circumstance of recurrent or metastatic disease. What does that mean for patients? How, how do we diagnose that? What set of questions come up when that uh, scenario presents itself? Just as a quick review, the breast is a, a glandular organ. It's made up of uh, lobules, which are made up of ducts which carry uh, breast milk and those are all intertwined into these lobules here. Um, uh, so it's a the uh, business part of the breast is really these lobules where the cells are that are dividing. Much of the breast greater than 90 percent is composed of adipose tissue and other connective tissue which uh, we're, we're not going to talk about diseases there of most of the breast cancer that uh, we're talking about arises in, in these lobular structures. What, so what, what is tumor conference? So before COVID, we used to all meet in person uh, at a long table. Everybody would gather around. Uh, there would be a pathologist and a radiologist at the front of the table. Radiologists would start off by showing some images, perhaps mammograms, uh, ultrasound, MR, uh, whatnot. There would be a discussion of the, the patient. Then 
a biopsy would have happened, and that's when the pathologist would then show some images of what the pathology showed. And after that, it's open for discussion. These members around the table will represent uh, oncology, surgery, uh, radiation oncology, other uh, support staff, nurse navigators, other nurse in the, the breast center who help with uh, shepherding the patient through the entire process. Really, this is where the care plan gets developed and those recommendations are brought back to the patient and, and put together. Nowadays with COVID for the past two years, we, we've been doing these types of meetings virtually. And uh, some hospitals, depending on the size of the hospital, may have one general tumor board where cancer patients get presented, could be a breast, could be lung, colon. Uh, many hospitals now are, are have transitioned to specific tumor boards, meaning there's a tumor board just for breast cancer, just for colon, just for uh, prostate, every organ system might have its own subspecialty tumor board with its own set of experts to discuss your care. Uh, at, at my hospital here, that's that's the way in which we do it. We have a dedicated breast cancer conference, so it's your breast cancer team discussing your particular case. Uh, each uh, attendee is, is an expert in, in their area of, of care of, of patients with breast cancer. The first patient we'll talk about is a patient who might have ductal carcinoma in situ, that's, that's abbreviated DCIS. And what that means is if we look at this diagram again of the breast, the, remember the lobe, the lobules here are made up of individual ducts. If we blow up one of the ducts, you can see that there's a lumen or a, a tube inside the duct, it's hollow. It's lined by a layer of cells and there's another second layer of cells around that. And then that's wrapped in a membrane, a, a basement membrane. The cells within the duct are the cells that divide and proliferate. And these are the cells that can give rise to cancers, either ductal carcinoma in situ, which we'll discuss now, or an invasive cancer. The concept of DCIS is that it has not breached this outer layer, this envelope of, of lining, the basement membrane. So theoretically, it has no propensity for spread, cannot get into blood vessels or lymphatics to spread to lymph nodes or distant organs. It's, it's in situ, it's confined by this wrapping around the duct. So these, even though these cells proliferate and they're truly malignant cells, they're beginning to clog up and completely occlude this duct. They're still confined within the duct space. They have no ability to uh, metastasize to other parts of the body. It's purely uh, in situ disease and, and it can be 100% curable at, at this point. And that's, that's the reason for frequent mammograms is to detect a cancer as early as possible. Uh, hopefully when it's just in situ like, like this and hasn't yet invaded. Uh, approximately 20% of the breast cancers that we do diagnose are, are DCIS, have not yet invaded. A typical mammogram uh, for DCIS, the real uh, uh, finding that radiologists look for are calcifications. And there are a number of different types of calcifications. I'm not an expert in radiology, but I'll just tell you that calcifications are sort of the, the canary in, in, the, in the mine, in that uh, some of them can be associated with DCIS. Some are benign and the expert radiologists can tell the differences between which ones look worrisome, which ones are benign and can be followed, or, or which ones do need further uh, follow-up here. Here's a cluster of, of the sort of white brighter areas here are calcifications, these punctate areas even up into here. Uh, the background, more whiter areas, it's just the normal breast parenchyma in, in the background. So it's these types of calcifications that, that radiologists will look for on screening mammography. And depending on the uh, worrisomeness of that binding, patient may undergo additional imaging 
and or could get a biopsy. And uh, this is the, the technique in which a breast biopsy is done. It's a stereotactic guided biopsy, which means it uses uh, computer imaging to localize that specific area on the mammogram that's abnormal and using an, a needle uh, similar to this, that area is targeted. And this is, this is what it looks like. This is what the tissue that comes out of that needle goes into formal in there by the radiologist in, in the mammography suite. And it comes over to pathology here in the lab. We'll open up the, the canister and find in there a number of cores. And uh, this is a magnified view, but you can sort of get the sense by the person's hand here in the forceps that these are small. They're really on the nature of one to two centimeters in length, just a couple of millimeters wide. But you can see there's, you know, there's some different colors here. There's some whiter, perhaps more solid areas and some hemorrhagic bloody areas. You might think, well, that's probably where there's something going on that's that's uh, of interest and, and that's that that is indeed the case and what we then will do is we will take that we'll process that tissue uh, overnight it goes into an instrument it's processed through a number of different steps of uh, alcohols to dehydrate the specimen and then the next morning uh, it's it, it's taken out of that instrument. It's embedded into paraffin wax, of which we can cut uh, sections on a, uh, a sharp knife to place onto slides. And I'll show a few of those images coming up. But this is what that looks like under the microscope at very low power. Those needle core biopsies of, of tissue, you can see the darker areas here are probably something worth looking at, whereas this intervening tissue is some of that background fat and connective tissue that I talked about. And here's one more higher magnification and yet another higher magnification. And, and this is a typical appearance of ductal carcinoma in situ. If you remember back at that cartoon where we were looking at the long tube, if you were to cut that in cross section and then look at it face on, this is this is what it would look like. That entire lumen here in, in this case has been occluded by uh, nearly complete proliferation of cells, yet they're confined. They're confined within that envelope wrapping of, of the duct, haven't yet uh, escaped, penetrated out through that basement membrane into the surrounding tissue. So this is uh, all in situ disease. I would show images such as this during the breast cancer conference. Uh, patients might get presented right after their diagnosis, so we might just have this bit of information to talk about. Uh, others may have gone on to surgery, and at, at that point, we would discuss uh, some of what, what we saw at surgery. Uh, I'll, I'll show you some of the tools we use during surgery. Uh, when a biopsy is, is done, there's always a, a little clip that gets deployed at, at the time of biopsy, and I'll show what that looks like and the reason for doing that is so that when a patient goes to surgery and they have a lumpectomy or even a mastectomy well this is a portable x-ray machine that we use right in the operating room we'll open up the front of it we'll put the specimen in there and it takes a uh, x-ray you can see right here here's a uh, specimen that has a needle in it that's been localized by radiology but you can see here the clips. Uh, there's there's a couple of different shapes of clips, but uh, we will know beforehand what kind of clip that patient had from their biopsy, so we know what shape to look for and how many. Uh, and the importance of this is we want to double check that we got out the area of interest, the area that had been biopsied that was atypical, that was or was DCIS or an invasive cancer. We want to double check that we did get everything out. This is just an example of some of the different types of clips that may be deployed during a biopsy by the radiologists. They have different names, top hat, cork, hourglass, and, and they do look like those shapes. Now these are on the order of one to two millimeters. They're extremely, extremely small. Uh, 
many different shapes, uh, sizes of them. Uh, this, this is an example of a uh, mastectomy that we received. And what we will do when, when we get it is that we ink uh, the specimen in, in its entirety. Uh, and the reason for inking is that we'll be able to orient the specimen. Uh, it will usually come from the operating room with some sutures uh, designating where it is. Is it lateral, anterior? medial, superior, inferior, so that's so that we can orient it. And we know that when we look under the microscope, if we see tumor near a, a, a blue margin, we'll know that it's close to superior. Or if it's close to black, we, we know it's anterior. And uh, those are important considerations, uh, whether we've gotten the tumor entirely out, uh, is the margin comfortable enough that the patient would not need additional therapy, such as going back to the operating room for a close or positive margin, or even maybe radiation to a particular region of the breast that had a, a very close margin. So the entire specimen gets inked. Sometimes this is done intraoperatively by, by the surgeon, so we will actually get it inked like this. Uh, other times we, we ink it down here in the lab. Uh, either way, it comes down with some orientation to it. Uh, so that when we slice it uh, and we can lose that orientation, meaning now uh, if we hadn't inked it, when you introduce a cut made by us, we want to make sure that uh, where, where we're cutting, we can tell the difference between a cut that we made versus a cut that the surgeon made in the operating room, which would be covered by ink. So we can again, tell the preciseness of, of, of those margins, how close uh, the, the tumor was in relation to that ink. And we'll, we'll section right, right through and we, we will look for and match it up. Now you see this, this is actually a recent patient. Uh, this is what her lumpectomy looked like in, in the operating room. You can see uh, there's actually three clips here. There's this one that looks like a ribbon uh, and then there's a couple of cylinder type clips. and uh, we, we did indeed, when we sectioned it, we found the little cylinder there, matches up almost identical. And here's the uh, ribbon shaped clip. And, and this, the, uh, you can recognize the shape for the breast cancer awareness. And, and that's a real ribbon, uh, true ribbon. That, and that's a tiny, tiny little one to two millimeter ribbon that uh, shaped clip that, that will get uh, placed at time biopsy. Here's what I mentioned when we then cut that tissue and we will process it. We load it onto an instrument here uh, and it makes very, very thin sections of tissue. This moves up and down and each pass of the paraffin block here will shave off. There's a blade right here. It shaves off a very thin, uh, less than millimeter thicknesses of tissue. And then that tissue is put onto a slide get stained and we look at this under uh, under the microscope here in our offices. This is that same breast, breast tissue the specimen that we were looking at. Here's the black ink and this is a very low power view. You can recognize these very, very round, regular appearing areas are the ductal carcinoma in situ where it's all confined. You can draw a circle around it and you can see uh, I'll, I'll measure this under the microscope and give an exact measurement. Now, this is not a positive margin, but you can see it's getting close to the ink. It's within one to two millimeters, and that's something I would put into my report. We would also discuss it at tumor board. I, I would show an image just like this and say uh, the, the black here is, is uh, posterior. This, this is a deep margin, and I would say DCIS is, is within two millimeters of the posterior. Now, all of this other proliferation here, this is invasive cancer. We'll, we'll talk about that on the next patient, but uh, often they, they coexist uh, simply because one can be a precursor to the other. Uh, so we will often see both DCIS and invasive cancer in the same sample, and we assess all parts of it separately. So uh, we'll give uh, distances and sizes of the amount of DCIS in the in the specimen, how close it is to the margin, which margins, 
and uh, are, are they clear or not? That's one higher power view under the microscope here, just showing this monotonous proliferation of cells completely filling up the, the duct lumen so that it's, it's uh, completely full. You can see this is a chunk of calcium here. Uh, perhaps there's another one up here and a third one there. And this, this would have been recognized as suspicious calcifications by the radiologist, which, which prompted the biopsy and the surgery here. The other key uh, event that happens at, at tumor board is, is the decisions, what, what decisions are made. And all patients' uh, cases are presented along with uh, following guidelines of the NCCN, which stands for the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. And this is, this is a, an organization that publishes regularly updated guidelines for uh, the care of oncology patients, and not just breast, but any type of cancer in, in the body, any organ system has its own guidelines, and this group works in concert with all of the major physician organizations. They work with pathologists, they work with radiologists, oncologists, surgeons to develop these guidelines, and this is really best practice or, or standard of care and uh, should, should be followed at, at tumor boards. And uh, what, what these entail are a number of guidelines about specific types of cancer, and they get very, very specific, as, as you'll see here as we, we discuss a few patients. But this is just a snapshot for ductal carcinoma in situ, uh, how the patient is diagnosed, how they're worked up, history, physical, mammogram. We will review the pathology. Now, we'll talk about hormone receptor status in, in a minute here, uh, then it's decided, does the patient need uh, breast conserving cancer or do they wish to go on to a total mastectomy? And uh, if there's breast cancer conserving surgery, is there a need for follow-up radiation? Uh, and each patient is discussed independently based on their pathology, their radiology, their, their clinical history, and, and, and their wishes too. Uh, the next major type of cancer, and we got a preview of it with the last case, was uh, an invasive ductal carcinoma. Now, once this normal duct here, if it proliferates to the extent that uh, the lumen has become completely filled, uh, we've reached ECIS, there may come a time when this basement membrane, this envelope wrapping the duct becomes breached and the tumor penetrates through and invades through the basement membrane, and now it is free to invade throughout the breast uh, locally, and perhaps more importantly, it now has access to lymphatics, including blood vessels and the lymph node chain, uh, and can spread to local lymph nodes, distant lymph nodes, and even distant parts of the body, lungs, uh, bones, brain, et cetera. And, and this is where we really want to catch cancer before it does this. But uh, when, when it does do it, we have a number of tools here that we're going to assess and try to draw some conclusions about the behavior of that cancer. Uh, it's, it's future behavior, it's the patient's prognosis and their, their best line of therapy. So perhaps the most common type of cancer that we diagnose uh, is an invasive ductal and it's estrogen and progesterone positive. I'll show you what that means, but HER2 negative, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute as well. Again, uh, a mammogram at press conference, it would be shown, and these, uh, in addition to possibly having calcifications, the real uh, difference between an invasive cancer and an in situ cancer on, on imaging is that there may be formation of a mass. Uh, an ill-defined or even uh, speculated appearing mass that has this worrisome appearance that uh, is going to get flagged and targeted for biopsy. Sorry, uh, targeted for biopsy. Uh, here's an image of, of that invasive cancer, and you can see here's a normal duct for reference that's cut longitudinally like we saw in the cartoon. So there's a little bit of a lumen, but the layers have just 
uh, compressed, so it's barely visible. And you can see that in contrast to these tumorous ducts that now have invaded outwards, and there's sort of this irregular haphazard distribution of, of tumor, and it's invading through this connective tissue, uh, fat, and fibrous tissue throughout the body. And as it does that, the body recognizes that it's foreign, it's abnormal, and there is a, a reaction that is mounted, and that's part of what contributes to the firmness or density or even the, the creation of, of a mass, not just the tumor itself, but the body's response to it. And this development of kind of dense scar tissue will contribute to the mass uh, formation. One of the most important things I do as a pathologist is in addition to the stain that I've been showing you, which is called a H&E or hematoxylin and eosin stain, that's what we use every day here at the microscope to make a diagnosis, to write our reports. But we can also swap out these dyes, these different pinks, reds, and blues, and change it up for different antibodies. And one such antibody is estrogen receptor, ER. And the estrogen receptor is located within the nucleus of, of the tumor cell, and it will stain brown. And everything else shows this sort of pale blue or negative staining. So it's very easy to tell using this estrogen stain, is this patient's breast cancer expressing estrogen or not? And in this case, you can easily see that there's lots of positive or brown nuclei here, and I would score that patient as estrogen positive. We can do the same with progesterone receptor, both estrogen and progesterone uh, commonly uh, get co-expressed together. Uh, so you may see that on a report that it's estrogen positive and there may be a percentage, we will often say 90% of tumor cell staining or 50%, and then also given intensity, we'll say it's strong staining, it's, it's moderate or, or it's weak. The decisions, now this is a completely different algorithm of decisions once a, a tumor is invasive. Uh, then we start talking about how, how big is the tumor, and that's something the pathologists will discuss at the tumor board based on what they've measured under the microscope. Uh, is it under half a centimeter? Is it greater than half a centimeter? And uh, what's the nodal status? Uh, when patients have had surgery, not only the, the breast tumor is taken out, but there's often a sampling of, of some lymph nodes. It may just be one lymph node, which we call a sentinel lymph node, or it may be uh, some regional lymph nodes, and we will look under the microscope and determine are those lymph nodes uh, free of tumor or has the tumor gotten into the lymphatic system, traveled to the lymph nodes, and, and uh, been, been held up, hopefully sopped by the lymph nodes. That, that is the purpose of the lymphatic system is to uh, capture uh, foreign uh, invaders, germs, but also tumors, and hopefully stop. It's, it's the filter for the blood, blood system and for the body, and uh, every organ has its own system of drainage of, of lymph nodes, and uh, we will look to see if any tumor cells collected within those lymph nodes. One thing that frequently comes up at breast conference is, have there been any additional studies done? Uh, meaning have there been any molecular studies? And this 21 gene uh, panel assay that's uh, talked about here is uh, Oncotype DX. Perhaps many of you have heard about that. That's the most commonly used one here in the US, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But we may uh, have done that. Those results will get presented at Tumor Board. And based on those results, uh, patients will be decided whether they will benefit from additional chemotherapy, uh, and endocrine therapy, tamoxifen, or, or not, based on what, what the score of that oncotype is. Uh, here's a sample report of what the oncotype recurrence score looks like. Uh, there'd be usually three numbers here, the recurrence score uh, uh, and a distant recurrence risk at, four, at nine years uh, with AI, which is uh, uh, aromatase inhibitors or tamoxifen alone, so endocrine 
therapy alone, not chemotherapy, just an endocrine therapy, what's the risk that that particular patient's cancer comes back? And then the third number here is if we add on chemotherapy to that regimen, what's the benefit that chemotherapy offers? What's the absolute uh, chemotherapy benefit? Meaning in, in this patient, there's less than a 1% uh, additional benefit of adding chemotherapy. And, and that's a discussion that uh, will then happen at tumor board. Is it worth the side effects of chemotherapy to offer just a less than 1% uh, improvement in re recurrence risk? Or is that something that will be taken back to the patient and discussed and the patient will opt for that and want everything done that's possible, even if it's just a small incremental increase in uh, uh, prognosis is is the patient willing to uh, take on that risk? And that's uh, something based on their age and also this score, the recurrent score. Uh, there is also provided within the Oncotype report uh, various graphs of uh, how many years out, uh, what's the risk of, of that tumor coming back based upon whether that patient gets endocrine therapy alone or whether they get endocrine and chemotherapy. And, and that's a personal discussion that not only happens between the patient and their doctor, but also uh, a lot of input comes at, at tumor board is, is that uh, information that will be brought back and, and discussed with the patient. Here's, here's an example of that paraffin block we'll, we'll make from the tumor. We'll cut in, into the, the slides that we uh, get all of that information from. And this is also what we do the oncotype testing on. Uh, when, say, say for instance, we present a patient at, at breast cancer conference and we decide, uh, yeah, we want to do oncotype testing on that, the pathologist will then retrieve the, the block of tissue that has the best sample of cancer. We select that and we'll send it out for, for the gene testing. The third type of patient I want to talk about that comes up frequently at, at breast cancer conference is the HER2 positive breast cancer. Uh, and this is often, or it can be an aggressive disease with a poor prognosis. Uh, often patients present uh, younger age with a higher grade of cancer. Often the, the tumors are a larger size, the lymph nodes may be involved, and they commonly may have estrogen and progesterone negative staining. So they do not express the receptors, which takes away benefit of, of uh, hormone therapy, aromatase inhibitors and tamoxifen. Uh, since the onset of Herceptin, uh, we've really seen a dramatic improvement in, in, the patient, in the prognosis of patients with HER2 breast cancer. And it's really been a revolution for, for oncology. Uh, just briefly, what is HER2? HER2 is a uh, protein uh, receptor on the surface of cells. This is a diagram or cartoon of a cell. And HER2 is, sorry. HER2 is just one protein of several family members that if it's overexpressed, it can combine with other HER2s and form this conjugate, which then will activate cells to proliferate, uh, migrate, invade, and this really drives tumor growth. And for HER2 positive breast cancers, this is the pathway that they're primarily using to uh, grow and spread. And we've now, with Herceptin, developed uh, a, a targeted therapy to uh, hit this cancer at its weak spot. And Herceptin will bind, prevent the uh, di dimerization of these HER2 units and also prevent the translation of the signal across the membrane into the cell to prevent cell growth. And, and it's really had remarkable uh, results. And how, how do we determine whether a patient's cancer is HER2 positive or not? Uh, we, we stain it, just like we did that I showed you with estrogen and progesterone. Uh, we also have a stain for HER2. And unlike 
estrogen and progesterone, which stains the nucleus, and we see uh, uh, small circles highlighting the nucleus. Here, this, this is a membrane stain, and recall from the prior slide, that's where HER2 is found. It's found on the membranes of cells. So if HER2 is present in, in the cancer, it's going to show a brown highlighting of all of these individual cells. And HER2, ER, and PR, those three stains are done on every newly diagnosed invasive breast cancer to look for and report the status of each of those markers. This is a case of HER2 positive breast cancer. We would score this as a three plus, which is the highest level. Uh, there's there's a HER2 a score of zero, one plus, two plus, and three plus. Uh, and e each cancer may show different scoring. Uh, as I mentioned, every cancer is different. And this is another piece of information that we'll put into the pathology, pathology report. We'll discuss at tumor board. And it, if, if positive, it opens up a whole uh, new set of uh, uh, possible therapies for that patient. And going back to these NCCN guidelines, this is just a snapshot for HER2 positive uh, hormone receptor positive breast cancer, you'll see pretty much a similar algorithm based on size of the tumor, nodal status, but in addition to other uh, adjuvant chemotherapy and endocrine therapy, now we're able to introduce uh, trituzumab or Herceptin into the, into the uh, different cocktails here and uh, choose the right one for the right patient. Uh, there's a similar algorithm for uh, ERPR negative, hormone receptor negative, but HER2 positive disease. Uh, we again will will weigh the benefits of adding traditional chemotherapy with Herceptin uh, based on that specific patient's tumor size, characteristics of their lymph nodes, and whether there's involvement of tumor with within those lymph nodes. The final type of breast cancer that we may present at conference is one called triple negative breast cancer, or it's abbreviated TNBC. And the triple negative simply refers to the three stains that I've been talking about here, estrogen, progesterone, and HER2 all being negative. You recall ER and PR uh, stains the nuclei of cells. It should be brown, but here it's staining that blue uh, color. This is a negative stain, and HER2 remember, should stain uh, in, a cytopl in a membranous pattern. And here, this is completely zero. This is a negative staining. So this is uh, triple negative. And as you might imagine, this limits further our options for therapy. It takes off the table uh, any benefit we might get from hormone therapy because it's not hormonally responsive, being ERPR negative. And we've also lost any benefit we might get from Herceptin simply because the tumor is not being driven in that HER2 pathway. But we, we do have effective uh, therapies and, and regimens for these patients. This uh, is, a, is a table of some of the characteristics of triple negative breast cancer. I just wanted to highlight uh, the epidemiology here. Uh, it's, it uh, comprises up to almost a quarter of the breast cancers we diagnose. So it's, it's a significant number. Uh, like HER2 positive disease, it often uh, affects a younger patient population. Uh, for some reason, African-American women of West African ancestry are, are at increased risk. Like HER2 positive, it, it uh, has aggressive behavior compared with non-triple negative or, or hormone positive disease meaning there's a higher likelihood of distant metastasis either at the time of diagnosis or in the future, and there can be a quicker uh, re relapse time for patients. The decision tree for these types of patients are a, a little bit different. Um, you can see the NCCN guidelines here for hormone negative or two negative, so again, triple negative. Uh, disease. We again base it on tumor size, which is this T stage, whether it's under half a centimeter, 0.6 to 1 centimeter, or greater than 1 centimeter, and the nodal status will then bring up discussion about what type of 
chemotherapy regimen will be best uh, for for that patient, and what what's their nodal status? Do they have positive lymph nodes or not? Uh, in triple negative patients, just uh, recently within the past few years, we do have uh, another line of potential therapy for these patients, and this it involves what's known as immunotherapy. Cancer cells, and this is a, a quick little uh, cartoon of how immunotherapy works. If this cell is, is a tumor cell, and here's a, a T cell, which is one of the inflammatory cells, it's a lymphocyte that uh, is, is charged with, with killing tumor cells. Uh, tumor cells can outsmart the lymphatic system, the, the patient's lymphocytes by uh, cloaking themselves in that they can uh, uh, bind to the T cell through the T cell receptor and PD-1, PD-L1 receptors. So if, if the tumor expresses this receptor and it matches up and binds with, with a T cell, it can completely inactivate that lymphocyte and prevent the body from destroying the tumor. And this happens more frequently with triple negative breast cancers than it does with, with hormone positive disease. And what we see in that case is that um, we can now introduce a drug that will block the binding of this receptor here so it's broken apart and in doing so releases that, that cloak and all of a sudden now this tumor cell is visible to the body. The body can see it and recognize it as foreign, as needing to be destroyed and the body can go about its, its business of working to destroy that tumor cell. And immunotherapy is, is one possible line of therapy that may be a benefit for triple negative patients, but not all triple negative patients, but a triple negative breast cancer patient, we may be asked by the oncologist to do a stain. And just like we do for estrogen, progesterone, and HER2, we can do a stain for PDL one and to look to see if the tumor expresses that receptor that would or would not bind to the body's immune cells and and cause cause it to be uh, invisible to to the body's immune system and this would be a case of no staining at all you can see it's there's no brown staining here but down here this is a pdl one positive cancer uh, this is a low power shot here's a higher power and you can see similar to her too it's got this uh, membranous staining pattern and this is a a tumor that then might benefit from immunotherapy. And, and that would be something we would discuss at Tumor Ward, whether it was a, a viable option, whether it was something that we, we thought might work for that particular patient. And, and that would be brought back and, and discussed with the patient. The final two scenarios that we uh, will not uncommonly see or present at breast conferences, this concept of neoadjuvant treatment. And what that means is neo means new treatment, meaning treatment before surgery. And uh, as you might have imagined, NCCN has guidelines about when somebody might want to consider neoadjuvant therapy. Uh, candidates for preoperative systemic therapy, typically it's, it's a patient who has inoperable breast cancer breast cancer because the breast cancer may be bulky, it's very large, there may be extensive involvement of lymph nodes at the time of diagnosis. Uh, and the hope is that rather than going straight to surgery, if we can preoperatively shrink that tumor with various chemotherapies and or radiation, can we uh, downstage the tumor from a higher stage to a lower stage and give that much more uh, success rate to surgery. Uh, what previously was an inoperable breast cancer might become operable by shrinking that tumor beforehand, getting it to a smaller, more manageable state, and uh, giving the patient a greater uh, a chance for a favorable prognosis here. And uh, this, this might be a, a typical patient I might present. Uh, this patient might be presented perhaps three times 
over the course of their treatment at, at tumor board. They might get presented initially at diagnosis and then uh, here at uh, uh, needle biopsy where we have a a shot of invasive breast cancer, similar to what we showed at the beginning. And you can see there's this is sort of a before and after. Uh, this is before chemotherapy, and this is after chemotherapy. You can see a lot of this busyness, a lot of these cells, this is all tumor cells here, have dropped out, they've died. We've only got a little bit of remaining, and it might not even be very viable tumor. And that's an important measure. That's something we assess. So uh, this is a patient who benefited from having treatment before surgery. And then at surgery, the pathologist here would, would look at the tumor and, and score it and see uh, what, what we use is this uh, formula, this calculator that's put out by MD Anderson uh, Cancer Center called the Residual Cancer Burden Calculator, RCB for short. And the pathologist will plug in the criteria from that tumor, the size of the tumor, uh, the cellularity, whether there's positive lymph nodes or not, and hit calculate and, and get a score. And that score will go into the pathology report, and that will then translate to valuable information for the care team about what's that patient's uh, propensity for cancer recurrence, for distant uh, metastasis, will they benefit from additional therapy after after surgery? So again, uh, NCCN guidelines will come up with another algorithm here. This is after preoperative therapy, we'll, we'll stage the patient and then make a decision on what type of uh, regimen will best serve that patient after surgery. The last category of, of patients here are those who may have been presented before. They're coming back with recurrent, either a local disease or metastatic uh, disease at a distant site in, in the body. A uh, couple of concepts that I wanna just emphasize here with, with these types of patients is that we review them, discuss them just like other patients. Uh, we will test all newly recurrent cancers or metastatic cancers, again, for estrogen, progesterone, and HER2. Uh, cancers can change. They can evolve. If a cancer was negative to start, it, it could be positive or vice versa. A positive ER cancer could become ER negative and vice versa for HER2. And based on what, what the pathologist will report out on, on that biopsy, then sets up uh, the different uh, regimens that could be possibly be used. And, and you'll see here, uh, immunotherapy might come up and that's what we talked about with the pd one This might also be a good time for testing BRCA uh, if that hadn't already been done for patients. Uh, knowing the BRCA status of a patient will give us valuable information about whether patients will uh, respond or benefit from PARP inhibitor therapy. And I'll just briefly show what, what that is and, and describe it. I'm sure many of you have heard about BRCA1 and 2. These are the breast cancer genes. And what BRCA is, it's, it's, it's a normal gene in everybody, and it's a uh, spell checker gene. Basically, when uh, cells normally will have DNA damage as they divide, uh, there's millions of cells at any one time dividing. There's likely to be some errors, and this BRCA system will repair breaks in the DNA and and uh, uh, make make sure that cell survives. Uh, so BRCA is is one mechanism for repair of of gene abnormalities, but also uh, PARP gene uh, PARP enzyme is also another way in which uh, genes can be repaired. The way we can take advantage of this for tumors is that if we know a tumor has a BRCA mutation, that means that the tumor's ability to repair itself has been damaged. So that tumor is only relying on this part pathway for repairs to keep it going. Uh, and in order for us to completely shut down that tumor, we know that the BRCA system, because it's, it's a BRCA mutated tumor, 
this is shut down. So what we can give the patient is a PARP inhibitor and shut down that pathway for repair so that these, these tumor cells, once they inflict some self damage upon their DNA, cannot divide further. And uh, that, that's why PARP therapy might be effective in patients who are BRCA uh, positive. Whereas uh, normal tissue doesn't matter. Uh, you could inhibit it with the PARP inhibitor, but because the BRCA pathway is still available, uh, gene mutations here will, will get repaired normally. So in summary, I want to close out here with a few comments before we take a few questions. Uh, tumor board is an important concept to know about. Uh, as a patient or a family member, you want to ask, ask your uh, care team, was, was, your, was your particular case presented at a tumor board? Uh, what type of tumor board is it? What were the recommendations made? Uh, can you learn about that? And can we talk about how those uh, decisions were made? And, and we want to be an active participant in that decision-making process. And I hope by showing you that process that the pathologist is really a key member, as is every other care team member. Uh, we don't often meet with patients. Uh, some places do offer an opportunity to meet with pathologists. It might be something you can ask about at your institution. Uh, but I hope you can see the, the value and the role that every doctor and nurse and other healthcare professional on the care team makes in, in your uh, care. I'll be happy to take a few questions. I'll, I'll leave the screen up here with my email contact info. I'm happy to take questions also by email if you think of something afterwards. Thank you so much, Dr. Misalek. That, that was really a very fascinating presentation. And I kept thinking, I really do wish I had had the opportunity of listening to this webinar in 2015 when I had my own breast cancer journey. It was really very informative. We have received a question through our uh, GoToWebinar. Um, anybody who'd like to post a question, they can post a question under questions in the panel. Uh, it's in the dark and shaded area. Just drop down on questions and you'll be able to type in a question. Um, the question is, must DCS develop a unique biology in order to become invasive, or is it a matter of volume or bulk that allows it to migrate outside the duct? It's probably more of the unique mutational signature of the DCIS, uh, and the reason I say that is because uh, we're, we're usually able to find some component of DCIS in, in the majority of invasive cancers, but not all invasive cancers have DCIS. Uh, and we certainly do see extensive DCIS, meaning we see uh, cases of DCIS that form a mass and that can look invasive by imaging, but we're uh, pleasantly surprised that it's all just in situ disease and it for some reason hasn't invaded yet. So I've definitely seen uh, extensive DCIS cases where it looks like it should have invaded and it hasn't. Uh, at, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, I've seen uh, cases of invasive cancer that have DCIS sprinkled throughout and around those individual foci of DCIS are little buds of newly invasive cancer uh, under a millimeter, and we call that microinvasive cancer. Uh, and presumably that, if it hadn't been resected at that time, would be forming new tumor buds. And I, I think it's the biology of the DCIS, uh, what pathway it's gonna go, is it gonna stay mostly confined or is it gonna break through that basement membrane early on and gain that propensity for invasion. Thank you. It, are, are patient cases presented at the tumor board after they receive an initial diagnosis or is it after their surgery? They, that, that's a great question. They can be presented at any time along the cancer journey. And frequently we do present, we represent patients from week to week or uh, 
after their therapy. So for instance, we may uh, we, we do devote time for the tumor board to talk about patients who've been newly diagnosed. Uh, those are patients who've just had their needle biopsy, they've received a diagnosis of cancer, and they're just beginning that journey. We'll make some, we'll, we'll present their case, we'll make some decisions, and, and we may see them back at tumor conference when they've had their lumpectomy or mastectomy. We'll re-review that pathology. There may be new findings, there may be new decisions to make based on some of the characteristics that I discussed here over the last hour about what, what that tumor showed. Was it close to margins? Did it have unusual ER, PR, HER2 staining? Or did we find some surprises in the lymph nodes? Uh, there's gonna be a whole new set of questions that come up that are gonna benefit from getting all the experts together and re-presenting the patient and re-discussing. Uh, so it's not uncommon that a patient might get discussed more than one time. Is this taking place in real time? Yes, it, it does. And the decisions here are uh, made same day as patients are being seen. We try and coordinate the tumor board with, with the clinic day, meaning right after tumor board, uh, some of the patients that we discussed are being seen by the by the oncologist or the radiation oncologist or or the surgeon shortly after the conference. So that information's fresh. They can talk about exactly what was discussed, what were the recommendations made, and and what's what's the best plan going forward. Can a patient or their designee attend the tumor board? Uh, that would be something to ask. Uh, your care provider. Personally, I have not uh, seen any patients attend, but I will tell you that, uh, as, as you mentioned in your comments here after the conference about knowing about uh, all of this behind the scenes work, some places do offer the opportunity to meet with the pathologist and to see your slides under the microscope here at Newton Wellesley Hospital. That's That's a that's a that's a privilege we offer patients. Uh, they can choose to elect and uh, to sit down with with us and look at their slides under the microscope and uh, be be more informed. My my philosophy is the 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 best patient is the most uh, well educated patient who's going to know everything they can about their disease to be an active participant in their care. And the only way to do that is to know the right questions to ask. We do have a question that's come in, but it's not really in the form of a question. Um, the person wrote, that, like, is there a way of knowing which is the primary tumor, if it's from the breast or from a, a, the ovary or? That's that's also a great question. And and that's something every day we, we do here as pathologists. We may get a biopsy of a lymph node from the neck or the liver. Uh, some distant site or, or the lung. And we are tasked with looking at that tumor under the microscope and figure out, is that tumor really a lung tumor? Or perhaps is this a metastasis? Has it spread from this patient's breast cancer they had three years ago that we thought was in remission? And similar to those stains that I showed you with the estrogen and the progesterone, we've got other antibodies that we can use to uh, try and interrogate that tumor under the microscope, look at it and figure out what's its signature, what's what's it expressing for markers. Is it expressing markers that say it came from the lung or the liver or the, the colon, uh, the ovary, or is, is this indeed the, the patient's breast cancer that's come back? And those, those are uh, uh, discussions and, and work that we do as pathologists collaboratively with other pathologists and we even have our own conferences where we where we grapple with these types of questions and uh, that's that's something we we do every day and that, that's what makes my my job exciting is unraveling those types of mysteries and if now that we know this information how do we go about as as you know patients who are advocating for ourselves how do we go about having these discussions or even obtaining copies of the reports from pathology? 
right? Uh, as of now, uh, you as a patient have full access to your entire medical record. Uh, 21st Century Cares Act, which was passed a, a year or two ago, uh, gives patients the right to have access to everything in, in the medical record. Uh, many patients may have access on their phone or at home through some gateway, but you can also request paper copies. Uh, I would recommend keeping a journal, uh, keeping tabs of your appointments, what questions you want to ask. If you have your pathology report, ask your doctor about it. If, if they can't ask, answer the questions, see if you can get in touch with the pathologist and what better person to ask than the person that wrote that report. So I, I would definitely advocate for trying to reach out to your pathologist if you can. Well, I want to thank you so much for this very informative webinar. And I know we had a question about whether or not your prior webinar is also available. And I can say, yes, it is available on the mbcc.org website. So thank you for that question. And thank you for this wonderful presentation. On behalf of myself, the MBCC board, and Cheryl Osimo, MBCC's executive director, I want to thank you, Dr. Misalek for this very informative discussion today. And I wanna thank all of our listeners for joining us. For those interested, the recording of this webinar will be made available later today on the MBCC website at mbcc.org. Thank you so much and have a good afternoon. Thanks everybody.